the marketing journey, right here, by me. <laughs> so what is the marketing journey, you might ask? The marketing journey is about where you plan and execute to bring things forward for your customers to be able to see, to be able to get to know your brand, to be able to get to understand who you are, and to be able to appreciate your brand. That's fundamentally important to have a strategic journey in order to make that happen. Let's go right here to slide number two. What is marketing, you might ask? Well, marketing is creating value. It's adding value. It's the process of exploring, creating, and delivering value to understand and identify the needs of the consumers. What are the needs of people who visit a salon? Haircut? Haircut? Anybody around here who wants to answer a question? I'm sorry. Self-care. Self Perfect. How about a spa? Relaxing. Exactly, relaxing. People who are working like crazy like I am and like all of you, everybody needs a spa, right? And estheticians, what's the need for esthetician? Exactly. So where do we market? Social media, definitely, which is what this presentation is going to be mainly focused on. Search engines, of course, print marketing with every Georgia Rep Mail and things like that. Billboards, definitely. Streaming services, televisions, every Georgia Rep Mail, which I already mentioned earlier. And the most effective tool, depends on the industry, but for this one that we're going to be discussing, in fact, for these ones that we're going to be discussing, is social media. Let's get to the next portion right here of this presentation. So right here, we're going to get to the strategies now. There are multiple strategies in marketing. There are five P strategies. We're going to be discussing, I think we're going to be discussing three or four P's that I created. But price, promotion, placement, product, those are the strategies, those are the four P strategies. In addition, there's a positioning strategy, which we'll be mentioning here too. But the price strategy, let's say you're opening up a business, right? Let's say you're opening up, you know, let's say PM salon. We'll say PM because we don't want to use copyright words. This salon, PM, just opened up right here on New York Lane. So we're starting a salon, right? And we got to get out to the consumers. We don't want to be, we're not Elon Musk where we could be able to charge high and engage in a price skimming strategy. The only value that a price skimming strategy has for business is that a price skimming strategy shows that you do have a high quality product. But at the same time, though, it limits your target audience and who you are. The price penetration strategy, on the other hand, is a strategy that focuses on entering the market. It's basically throwing a large net into the market, basically, and telling the market, hey, you know, we're here, our business is open, and we're here to bring value to you. So the benefits of the price penetration strategy is that you're opening up yourself to the marketplace, letting people know that your place is affordable and high quality at the same time. The only downside to it is that the profit margin is significantly reduced. And that's obviously because you're entering the market and you're engaging in a way that people, you know, like that you can be able to focus on having a reduced price and then the profit margin goes down because revenue and then profit, if you're familiar with an income statement. I'm sure you are familiar with how an income statement works, obviously. So what is better for, for this kind of industry? Depends on the business. Let's say you're an established business, right? Let's say you have one location somewhere else, right? You could have a price skimming strategy, but the only thing is that if you're new to an area, you don't want to be so high with your prices. If you're a new business, right, if you're just starting up, price penetration is the way to go. And more often than not, a lot of salons are newer businesses. So let's continue on, shall we? Promotion strategy. Promotion strategy is basically when we come up with coupons, when we come up with incentives, offers, things like that to get customers engaged. This is applicable for both established businesses and starting businesses. Why is promotion strategy so important, you might ask? Well, because you want to keep the customers engaged, number one. You want to keep your brand you know, going, number two. And number three, you want people to keep coming and coming and building a brand loyalty like that. So different types of promotion strategies you could have. Incentives, coupons, discounts, and sales. And I'm sure that you could, I'm sure that if you've ever worked in a private sector before this place, you could attest to that, seeing that all the time. And plus you see that in, in advertisements. Offers, a free service with, a, with the value of a, higher, of a higher price. So let's say you're going to be um, 
selling a balayage treatment, right? You get a free haircut with a balayage treatment. So it's something like that, right? Or with esthetician, let's say you're, uh, you know, you're making somebody have a, like a facial, right? You give them a high quality facial at a, at a high price, and then after that, you may be giving them like a, a threading or something like that with an esthetician. Or a spa, give them, give them a whole full body massage, and then maybe you know, paint their nails or something like that with a manicure. I'm just giving different examples here for different industries, but still, that's importantly done. And then a contest, giving someone a prize, and then they keep wanting to come back. And when you give them that prize, then they might say, hey, you know something, I might want to buy other services from your company. Because once they get to know that service, then that's where the promotion strategy comes into play. We're going to be getting more into the promotion strategy later on in this presentation, especially with social word of mouth, which I will get into in a little while. So let's start with the placement strategy. Placement strategy is where your content is going to be placed. Meta Platforms right here has a very large, believe it or not, you would think that it doesn't have that. A lot of the people that use, in fact, I believe it's over 50% based upon this equation, show over between 18 and 24 and 35 and 44. People would think it's for old people in this age group, between, in, the, um, in the boomers and even the silent generation. It's not always like that. In fact, a lot of young people use meta platforms, especially Instagram. Facebook, though, has been used by more people in this age range right here, believe it or not, 35 to 44, 45 to 54, and then this age range. But mostly it's Instagram, though, that's used in this group, especially the millennials and the zillennials. I assume all of you are zillennials, right? Awesome. I'm a zillennial, too. <laughs> um, so let's continue on here, shall we? Now we go into TikTok and YouTube. TikTok users, great for young people. You want to show how your business creates the amazing work that you do. Let's say you're giving somebody a Brazilian blowout, right? You want to show the process to the consumers and then ultimately drive home the message saying that this is what we do. TikTok brings that forward, especially to younger audiences. The younger people want to know what goes on in the business. Is that correct, my younger audience? Awesome. Awesome, awesome. And then YouTube right here. These stats right here from YouTube. Here are the stats right here. This is according to, let's see, data, data portal right here. 397 million users, 18 to 24, 25 to 34, for 522.5 and 422 million users, 35 to 44. An overwhelming majority of people right here are in, a, are in the younger age range. In fact, we also have some older consumers on YouTube too. But they're less common, obviously. They're 47%, I believe, in that, in that, in that realm, from 35 down there. But yeah, it's really high, though. I think it's incredible what you have here. Sorry about that. I'm a little bit, I'm like trying to figure, find everything right here. Um, so let's continue on here, the important stuff now. We already know those statistics. Let's talk about the value that, the, that those things bring before we get into this portion. So, how does TikTok bring value to your consumers? TikTok brings value to your consumers because you want to show them what your business does, obviously. And you want to also highlight their, tes their testimonials. Making your customers smile, which the customer is the number one aspect of this industry. Without your customers, you don't have a business. Let's be real here. Your customers are your company. You want to highlight them, not just hair highlights, but you want to highlight them in the sense of showing what they feel, showing their experience in the industry which we're getting into later on, which is, which is the crowning jewel of this presentation. The so God bless you. So yes, we're focused on that. For Facebook ads, Facebook ads are great, especially when it comes to targeting. In fact, Facebook has better targeting than TikTok has, because Facebook, you can go down to the street level. You can go down to even creating fences, geofences. Geofences, are, are, are any of you familiar with geofencing or not? So what geofencing is basically, you're literally creating an imaginary fence, right? Like this is, this is the point of, 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 of origin right here. This is the fence right here. And then you could exclude certain areas from advertising. Those are for larger budget campaigns. But for smaller budget campaigns, you could do zip code targeting and things like that. And a lot of times, local salons will be using zip codes and certain targeting measures like that. So 
What is a great time to put out content, right? Right there, 8.30, noon and 5.30. Why? Because people are not working at that time. They're on their break, their lunch break at noon. They're heading home on the bus or on the train or you know, they're about to leave to go, to go home from work. Or they're getting into work at 8.30 a.m. Those are the best times because that's when everybody's on their, on their devices. So um, yes, to continue on, Let's go into this aspect right here. The diversification of content. Reels. Why are reels important to your industry? Like I mentioned earlier, it's important to have reels because you want to show what you do. You want to show the products you use. Don't get into too much detail with the products. You don't want your competitors seeing too much. But you want to show what you have to offer to the, to the public. Deliver client testimonials. Testimonials is the most important part of the industry. Christina. How can you test to that? How can I test the testimonials? Yes. I post them often. Um, and has it gotten business? Well, not for my particular business, but for here, as like students and past students have they they enjoyed the program, they passed their state boards, they had a great experience. And that brings people into the door. Absolutely, because it's they it's not just me saying it. Of course, I'm going to say it because I want the students here, but if a student who actually ran through the program and witnessed it and went through it physically and enjoyed it, they're sharing their experience with everybody on Exactly. On and that's what you want your customers to share with you guys, with, with you ladies, excuse me. Um, and also, like I said, show the product you can use. You're not limited to those things, obviously. In fact, there's no limitation on what you can post, but what I say is this, always maintain brand consistency. Drive home that message with the brand. Let people know what your brand is about, sometimes in a subliminal way, but also make sure the message is clear. And it shouldn't be redundant either. Posts, let your content tell a story. What's your story? What's your business? What are your beliefs? What does your business do to make the world a better place? Because the fact of the matter is that having a business requires a need, a want, a desire, a goal. Give consumers a reason why they should use your company through subliminal messaging. Why should people use my company, 123 Publishing Incorporated? Well, number one, we have six years of experience in business. Number two, commitment to customer values. Number three, commitment to delivering the best quality of product with websites, virtual tours, things like that, all that, all that sort of service quality. And then finally, stories. Believe it or not, stories are very beneficial. You know, they don't, they don't always warrant likes and posts, you know, like li likes and shares and all that stuff. But stories are great because of the fact watching. people are watching. Exactly. And they keep the relevance of the brand. Let's get to the next thing here. What is the most effective form of advertising? Say it with me. Word, word of mouth. <laughs> exactly. So word of mouth is great because of the fact that people, <laughs> it's self-explanatory. People are saying it about you. People are remembering you. People, you made an impression on somebody that lasts for that forever in them. So how does social word of mouth work? Unfortunately, not a lot of businesses do this. More and more are starting to do this, but not enough though. Invite your guests to be collaborators. And so this goes into the promotion strategy. Collaborations. If your guests you know, want to be collaborators, send them a little appreciation. Say, hey, we'll give you a free service if you collaborate with us and remain a collaborator until your next visit. Brand loyalty, next visit. And then collaboration, you know, people on their audience see what you're doing, which is important in that aspect. So you want to push those collaborations in such a great way with social word of mouth. You want to expand your audience organically too. It, you don't have to pay any money for that. Think about that. Isn't that amazing? It's free advertising. And frankly, granted, you might have to you might have to give a little to get to get a lot, but still, that's a great thing, honestly. You're the best thing. Exactly. The importance of social word of mouth with the consumer too. The consumer's perspective is also focusing on making the consumer feel more important. What you're looking at right here is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. In fact, the first three needs right here tie into social word of mouth: self-actualization, esteem, and belonging. Make the consumer feel part of your brand, belonging. Make them feel important, esteem, 
making them feel great about themselves, making them feel that you did a great job making them look beautiful and making them have a wonderful day and making them feel relaxed. And self-actualization, making them feel important like they are above all. That's why social word of mouth is so important like that. Next thing, paid advertising. Paid advertising is so important because of the fact that you also want to target, like I mentioned earlier, you, know, you want to be able to target certain areas when you're putting out content and ads like that. So going from the gate, starting a business, right? We'll get to that later on in terms of how much you should spend and things like that. But if you're going to st spend money, you should estimate your revenues first of what you're going to estimate. You should base it on industry averages and based on the quality of work in some ways. And base it on the area. There's so many things you could go and you could look into, but always estimate your revenues and come up with a goal first. And then use that goal as a marketing budget like that. That's one thing you could do. But if you're an established business, we can get into that part next. So right here, there are different types of levels of advertising with paid advertising. You have the ad set level, you have the campaign level, and you have the ad level. The campaign level goes up top, obviously. The campaign level is the overall overarching world that you're going to be focusing on. Now the ad set level is where you're planning out your budget, how much you're going to spend, and your target audience. On, social, on some social media platforms, you can do this thing called A-B testing, which A-B testing is basically you can be able to test different audiences like that. Now granted, those require larger budgets, but still the fact of the matter is that A-B testing really does wonders, especially when you want to know who your audience is. So let's continue on here. The ad, set, ad level, by the way, I forgot to mention it's your creatives. That's also pretty important, right? <laughs> um, let's continue on. So right here, the types of the target audience. So in your case, your target audience would be the ordinary consumer. That would be your overarching target audience. Then below there, there are subsets. Geographic segmentation, psychographic segmentation, behavioral segmentation, and of course, demographic segmentation. Now, the social media platforms, in some cases, limit the segmentation for many different reasons. Um, you know, data laws, things of that nature, obviously. And the fact of the matter is that we want to focus the segmentation on age, not necessarily gender, unless it's female-specific type of service or male-specific type of service. And also, the other thing you want to focus on with segmentation, with demographic segmentation, is the income level. Geographic segmentation, well, that's self-explanatory. Behavioral segmentation, how do consumers behave? What actions do consumers take? Things of that nature. And then psychographic segmentation, what are they interested in? What products and services are they interested in? What are they focused on? So those are some things that are important like that. These segmentation techniques, by the way, I forgot to mention, they're all based upon really how you know, like what kind of campaign you're running. That's what these segmentation techniques are based upon. So creative strategies now. Second, develop the creatives. Your creatives want to convey a message of who you are, what your brand represents, and what you're trying to convey to the consumer. By maintaining consistency with the creatives, you develop a common bond with the person. And finally, what you need to do is you need to make sure that that common bond is positioned in such a way that they'll remember your brand in different aspects, which we're going to get into next, the positioning strategies. So positioning strategies are fundamentally important for many reasons. You want, to know why, you want people to know why your product is better. You want people to know why your product or why your service is all that, why your salon is all that, why your esthetician center is all that, why your spa is all that. You want people to know why your brand is all that. Why you stand up for your competitors, and don't say things like we, you know, like Clorox is better than than uh, you know than than, um, than the other one, than Lysol, or this is better. Than this don't do that. Be sublime in that messaging, but be clear at the same time. It's a hard, it's a science, but I know you can do it. Though we're this young generation, we're this young generation. We have the minds of creativity. Why? Do people choose your product or service? Why should people choose your brand? And what are the values your brand conveys to people? And a lot of young people are big into corporate social responsibility just to let you know something. In my opinion, what you should also do 
which I will mention that in, in a little bit in terms of you know, my off the presentation speech. With corporate social responsibility, you want to show how your products are friendly to the world, even environmentally friendly. You want to show that, which is a big thing nowadays. Yep. Budget and launch strategies. OK, the minimum, 5% of your total revenue should go into your marketing budget. And in all reality, a lot of marketing companies use this thing called the 7 to 8 rule. The 7 to 8 rule is 7 to 8% going into your budget. And that's in terms of your top line on the income statement, the revenues. Different ad sets call for different budgets. But the more you risk, the greater the reward is, obviously. Now let's go to the, the next one. The, the other thing I want to mention in this thing, by the way, I forgot to mention this portion. Don't let the consumer see the same creative all the time. The max you want to run for creatives for are two weeks. That's it, two weeks. Not ads, not, not ad sets, but creatives though. You want to change the creatives out every two weeks. And two weeks should be the maximum. Because people see the ad multiple times and they get bored out of their minds with that. Those are called impressions. We'll get into those definitions later on. Key performance indicators. Bingo. Conversions right here. How a person basically buys your product. If they buy the product, if they buy the service. That's what a conversion is. What they got out of the ad. Click through rate. Your clicks divided by your amount of reach. The reach, how many counts saw your ad? Impressions, how many times somebody saw the ad? A two to one ratio of impressions is pretty good, honestly. That means you're not you know, reaching the same audience over and over and over again, but you're not reaching them one and done. You want at least, you want two impressions, which is good, honestly. In some cases, up to three or four over a lengthy period of time, but two is, usually a good number to look at, two to one ratio. CPM, cost per how many impressions you do. Those ad, that, that, that key performance indicator is more for reach type of ads. There are different types of ad creatives on Facebook, on Instagram, on TikTok. You could do link click ads, you could do you know, conversion ads, you could do lead gen ads, you could do all sorts of ads. But CPM is more for reach and impression aspects, for brand awareness type of ads. And finally, the sales revenue changes. Tracking your sales revenue on the income statement. That's more of a traditional form of tracking things, but that's also a very valuable form in terms of the, the revenue changes after that. Obviously, you can't control the bottom line, but the revenue aspects. There are also some other aspects, returns on advertising, return on investment. Those are some other aspects that you can focus on. You know, the revenue versus the, the advertising dollars, revenue versus the marketing dollars. You know, those are certain aspects like that. And just to let everybody know this, marketing is not advertising. Advertising is an element of marketing. Marketing is the broader picture. Advertising is more of a, set, a specific type of action you're taking to build your business up. Finally, you want the, the ultimate goal in this whole presentation is to show the public the value your brand presents, what your company represents, and who you are as a company. You want your business to know that. You want your public to know that your business provides great value. So I want to thank you all for being here today. And uh, I want to congratulate you for your amazing participation and, and appreciation for this presentation. Let's get to the questions now. Thank you, for, thank, you for, thank, thank you for the question. You want to have a perspective where people can remember the logo. You, want it to be, you don't want it to be too ostentatious, but you don't want it to be like just a little line. Right. You want to have it where there's some subliminal messaging in it, but you also have like a minimalist perspective in some ways. If you notice, a lot of big brands have been shrinking their logos, like Pringles, you know, they, don't, they used to have this elaborate logo. Now they just have the two, the two eyes and a mustache. Mm -hmm. You know, Disney used to have an elaborate logo with the Mickey Mouse thing. Now it's just the word Disney on there. Right. Certain companies have certain, you know, like have, down, have not downgraded, but they've minimized their logos. But it's all dependent on your brand, though. Right. It's all dependent on your brand. So let's say you're a place like 
let's say AFN, right? A Victorian destination. A place that feels like a beacon of light and a city on a hill for you as a consumer. You want it to have an angelic appearance to it. Gold, you know, like shining gold, something beautiful like that. So certain colors, certain, you know, fonts, those aspects have to reflect who your company represents or what your company represents. And also like your target demographic. Exactly. Exactly. Like my company has a more elaborate logo, mm -hmm. but I chose the logo because my company is supposed to be creative and zaning. Right. 123 Publishing, a creative digital marketing company. So you see my logo has the following. Creativity, which is one star, plus research, which is another star, plus understanding where you came from, which is Staten Island in there. That's the Staten Island portion of the logo. But we're also a Staten Island-based company. Plus the street to success, the gold star in the center. So that logo reflects my company's formula like that. But um, different logos have different meanings like that. Mine has a more you know, creative, zany meaning, obviously. But we also are not so crazy that we're like in your face sort of thing. Like we're more of a, you know, we, have, we have a logo that people remember. So you want it like that. Now in my case, unfortunately, I couldn't have, you know, like, like one, two, three, publishing and create a digital marketing company. We, you know, we, when, from the beginning, my mistake was like having the name one, two, three, one, two, three, publishing. But I was learning from my other people in my industry. They were coming with fancy schmancy names for their, for their agencies. So. I just come with my name, <laughs> but um, yes. But anyway, that's you know that's a great question, and I hope I answered that question well. Thank you. I appreciate it. Any other questions? Go ahead. I'll tell you how. I'll tell you how. Collaborating with people is fundamentally important. Not just consumers, but you could also even collaborate with industry professionals as well. Even do podcasts, perhaps. Engage a podcaster. Engage aspects where you show public the public your, your work. And you don't want to use the same hashtags over and over again. Because the algorithm will then say that you're spamming. You want to focus your aspect on a certain way of messaging your brand. You want to be able to engage you know, other content creators. You want to even do, inf do influencer-based marketing. Now, that can cost money, influencers. But if you have a quality influencer in the area, hey, engage the influencer. And there are so many influencers out there. And the best type of influencer is somebody who's relevant to, your, to, to what you're offering to the consumer. Like, what do you want to do exactly? Both hair and makeup. Both hair and makeup? So you want to reach out to people who are in that industry. And even celebrities, if, if you really want to go big. But collaborations are definitely key to that. And I'm sorry if I'm stressing that so much here, but I've seen businesses grow because of collaborations. My clients have grown because of collaborations. My clients engage their consumers directly because of collaborations. And people have gotten results because of it. And those are organic results. So how would they go about collaborating? I'll tell you how. When we do the collaboration later on today, when, when we do the video of the collaboration, like saying, I love Paul Mitchell, I am going to put it on my page, and I'm going to invite Paul Mitchell to school as a collaborator, and I'll show you all how that works, which you'll see in a minute, in, in a few minutes. But that's the way you do that in terms of the organic aspect of it. The paid aspect, of course, you can pay for more views, but honestly, it's, if you have a really great video, you can do through, through play advertisement, but if your video is more, you know, like just you know, daily content, then my best advice would be to focus on doing more collaborative engagements with different types of people who are influential in the, in the industry. So that's another question I have. Um, mm -hmm. When you're creating content, because I know what you said, I want to just clarify really quickly. Go ahead. So remaining consistent with like branding and everything, but also like having a variety of content. Yes. So what I mean by that is this, right? A, a, uh, that's your question, right? Yeah. What I mean by maintaining consistency is show your message, but don't show it in a redundant fashion. Like, don't slap a branding bar on top of something constantly. Mm -hmm. Don't slap a, a don't white label with a logo constantly. Yeah. Show things like what your company does and why your company is great, and and don't even you know use the same colors, but like make it so that way people understand what you do. Mm -hmm. 
give people a message of who you are. Let people appreciate the work you do. Exactly. That being an example, and you also show your story. Tell people your story. Tell people how you got to start, because you're the face of your company. You're the face of your brand. Let people know why you, they should work with you. Remember, half, more than half this industry is service oriented. More than half this industry is understanding people. It's this is honestly an old reality. This is a psychology industry. If you think about it like that. This is what this industry is about. They want to be, be able to relate to you. Exactly. Maybe even do a series. Right. That's what I was thinking about. That's a big, a big thing. A series. Personalize your content. Yes. Any more questions? Sure. Great question. So my preferred platform, I do love TikTok. I will say that right now. I'm a big TikTok fan. But I also love Instagram because Instagram is great for younger audiences too. I love Instagram because it engages the younger audiences. And the younger audiences are becoming more older, not more older, older and more diverse in their thought mindset and diverse in other ways too. So we want to focus on you know, using those type of platforms. For advertising, definitely use Facebook. Those consumers have more money to spend, believe it or not, on Facebook. They're older consumers, Facebook, even though I said earlier that, that Meta Platforms has a younger base in some ways. Facebook does lean more towards the older audience. But um, when it comes to certain aspects with, with younger people, definitely Instagram and TikTok, especially for this industry. And Instagram, is, and Instagram is also important for the collaborations. Granted, you can do collaborations on Facebook too nowadays, but Instagram is greater for collaborations, especially for younger people. And that's who you're marketing to at the end of the day right now. You're a younger person, people want to do the same business with, with the same demographic. Let's be real here. Any other questions? No questions? Go ahead, go ahead. Yes. I love the questions. With the 7 to 8% rule that you were talking about earlier, what, because I know we talked about like the last question, like what companies are like most popular, but specifically like with ads, what companies would you set the most on for your marketing? It's all on a case by case basis, honestly. Mm -hmm. Different companies have different types of budgets, obviously. Right. The larger the company, the larger the budget you'll have. So it's all dependent upon the brand. There's no set in stone type of situation. Now obviously don't spend $300 a month on, on advertising, yeah. but don't spend an exorbitant amount if you're starting out either. Have a budget ready. My best, my best recommendation to you is to do an industry average comparison. See what businesses are spending on, on their marketing. That's what I would say like that. Industry average, compar like industry average comparisons understand what businesses are spending on their marketing. And frankly, you know, when you do that research, you then be able to understand things like that. And just don't use one source and just throw it out like that. Look at many sources. I forget about Wikipedia. Wikipedia is an open source platform. <laughs> Maybe ChatGBT might work, but you know, I'm being funny when I'm saying that obviously. I'm trying to be funny. Have, have, you ever, have, have any of you used ChatGBT or not? I love it. You've used ChatGPT? Has it worked for you or not? Awesome. It's the future now. It's an artificial intelligence, pla intelligence platform. Now, if you know, but don't use it to cheat though, whatever you do. Use it responsibly. With great power comes great responsibility. And you have to know what you're doing to some extent. You can't just go in there like willy-nilly and just say, tighten me this thing up. Although in some cases you can, they're going to know already. People are going to know that this is, yeah. That's, that's so you get higher up in search engines if you repeat certain words, correct? Not, don't, don't, be, don't be too redundant on your search engines. You know, 1.5% of the time is good to have in terms of keywords on the website. 
And the keyword, and we could get into that subject matter at another session, because that would be a whole new session. Right, right. This session was mainly about introducing the marketing journey. And the fact of the matter is that this journey is great for strategic planning and things like that. This is what this session was mainly about, was strategy and execution to some extent. So thank you all for being here today. Thank you all for engaging this interesting seminar, if you found it interesting. I found it interesting speaking with all of you, and uh, I appreciate the wonderful opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to be doing a reel, talk, telling everybody, you know,